Welcome back to part two of Personal Protective Equipment and Assessments. I am your instructor, Marcus Weesaw, and my email and telephone number are listed on the screen. So if you have any questions about the subject matter of this course, feel free to contact me at your discretion. If you want to review the objectives, just hit pause on your video player and read the screen there. But for now, we're going to go ahead and move on to training. I want to emphasize that there are many types of PPE that could be worn in the workplace. And so what this particular course module it has been geared towards or what it's been designed for is to just give you the overview of personal protective equipment. And then we'll get into assessments a bit later in part three. But one of the uh, points I'd really like to drive home here is that Whenever an employee is required to use any type of personal protective equipment, the employees must be trained in the following from a site-specific perspective. So I want to emphasize that this course doesn't really include a site-specific component to it. So additional training might be necessary in the workplace for any PPE that falls outside the scope of this presentation. So employees are required to know the following. When PPE is necessary, what type of PPE is necessary. If you have to put it on and take it off, adjust it or wear it, uh, we want you to be able to do that properly. What the limitations of personal protective equipment are, especially the limitations of the PPE that you have been instructed to wear. And then finally, proper care, maintenance, useful life and disposal. So for example, a common Thing that I see in industries is I see that a lot of people will hold on to their hard hat forever. I've seen hard hats with 1980, 1978 stamps on them for the year and we're all the way in 2013 now and so that's kind of interesting that someone would keep a hard hat that long uh, because they've grown attached to it. That's just a common example of useful life disposal, re repair, maintenance of one, one type of uh, personal protective equipment. So let's go ahead and move on. What I'd like to do is just cover the very basics of what most industries require in terms of uh, personal protective equipment. So I thought we would begin this discussion with eye protection. So what are some of the common causes of eye injuries? Dust and other flying particles such as metal shavings or sawdust. Molten metal that splashes if we're in a metal foundry scenario. Acids and other caustic liquid chemicals that might splash. So we're looking at acids and then I should add bases as well. Blood and other potentially infectious body fluids or materials that might splash, spray, or splatter. And intense light such as that uh, created by welding. Uh, like UV light and then uh, laser radiation and the associated light of lasers. Safety glasses. Let's go over the general requirements of safety glasses. Uh, a couple facts for you here. They're usually made with a metal or plastic frame. Uh, there's no requirement on, uh, on the material. As long as it's durable, you're usually in good shape. If you look at the bottom uh, bullet point there, they must be Z87 approved or ANSI Z87 approved. And if you look on the arm or sometimes it's uh, stamped on the lens itself, but make sure that all safety glasses worn for safety purposes are ANSI Z87 approved. And if you wear prescription eyeglasses, a lot of prescription eyeglasses are also ANSI Z87 approved. But if you need to get side shields, they're pretty easy to put on, so you would just put those on for the, um, to keep things from coming in from the side. And so I want you to notice that safety glasses are designed for impact from flying particles, like grinding or pieces of wood coming off uh, from sawing or something like that. Okay, so that's the purpose of safety glasses is basically to protect from a moderate impact. Welding shields, uh, welding shields protect eyes from burns caused by infrared or intense radiant light. And they protect face and eyes from flying sparks, metal spatter, 
and slag chips produced during welding, brazing, soldering, and cutting. Laser safety goggles uh, basically protect your eyes from intense concentrations of light produced by lasers. And a lot of people don't realize that lasers are in so many different places. They're in so many different industries. And a lot of times people get a little tunnel vision. I think that lasers are going to be germane to, say, healthcare or laboratories. But that's not always the case since we use lasers with so many electronics these days. Face shields protect the face from nuisance dust and potential splashes or sprays of hazardous liquids. They do not protect from impact hazards. And so a common example of the use of a face shield uh, requirement would be pressure washing. When individuals go out and they use a pressure washer, what is required for personal protective equipment there is both safety glasses that we discussed, the Z87 type, as well as a face shield. And so we have uh, two types of protection there because face shields don't protect from impact hazards, so we have to have that extra protection for eyes. Let's move on to head protection. What are some common causes of head injuries? Well, overhead fallen objects, uh, bumping your head against fixed objects such as exposed pipes or beams, uh, taller individuals tend to have this problem more than shorter guys, but it still happens. And contact with exposed electrical conductors. There are three primary classes of hard hats. First we have class G, second we have class E, and then we have class C. Now class G, or formerly class A, protects uh, against electrical hazards up to 2200 volts and a class E protects from voltage of up to 20,000 volts and so if you have a hard hat that is class E it's inherently also rated for class G and so class G hard hats are usually for general service uh, and they provide a decent level of good impact protection, but very low voltage protection. Now, Class E hard hats uh, protect uh, against those 20,000 volts again, so we consider that a high voltage shock and, and, and burn protection as well. And then we have uh, protection from overhead fallen objects in addition to that. I do want to note here that most of the hard hats that you're going to get at industrial stores is going to be a Class E it's, it's quite difficult unless you're specifically looking for a Class G hard hat to acquire that. Class C, the C literally means conductive, so it's a metal hard hat. And so the only industry that I really see Class C hard hats utilized in these days would probably be uh, tree logging and tree felling. And even then, a lot of the companies are transitioning over to the... Uh, uh, high impact composite plastic that we find in class E hard hats. Let's move on to hearing protection. Here are a few examples of hearing protectors. We have earmuffs, earplugs, and canal caps. All of these must be selected appropriately based upon the noise reduction rating that is needed for a particular work environment. Let's move on to foot protection. What are some common causes of foot injuries? Heavy objects such as barrels or tools that might roll onto or fall on employees' feet. Sharp objects such as nails or spikes that might pierce the soles or upper, uh, uppers of the ordinary shoes. Molten metal that might splash on feet if you're in a metal foundry uh, operation hot or wet surfaces and slippery surfaces. Safety shoes. Safety shoes are also rated, especially steel-toed boots. They have different crush force ratings. I believe they start at uh, about a thousand pounds and go over to a little bit more than a ton. I think it's about 2,200 pounds. I'd have to look again. But I believe the ratings are A, B, and C. And I think C is uh, that lower scale, about a thousand pounds. And then 
B is somewhere in the middle, about 1500, and I think Class A uh, steel toed boots are around uh, 2000, 2200 uh, foot pounds of crush force. And so safety shoes have impact resistant toes and heat resistant soles that protect against hot surfaces common in roofing, paving, and hot metal industries. Some have metal insoles to protect against puncture wounds, and some may be designed to be electrically conductive for use in explosive atmospheres or, or non-conductive to protect from workplace electrical hazards. So nonetheless, we do have to select the right type of uh, steel-toed shoes or safety shoes uh, in order to address any uh, workplace hazards related to these kind of issues. Metatarsal guards are just uh, a part of the shoes are strapped uh, to the outside of the shoes to protect the instep from impact and compression. So basically what we do is we have just a little bit more protection than just the, the toes and so the protection extends a little bit more uh, to the upper part of the foot towards the ankle than traditional steel toed boots. Let's discuss hand protection. Uh, most of the injuries that I see in uh, almost every uh, type of organizational setting has to do with hands. And I believe that's because we're always using our hands. Uh, people tend to put their hands where they shouldn't put them. Uh, and we just use our hands for the majority of our work and so I think that's the, the prime reason for uh, so many hand injuries. But here are some um, injuries that you need to guard against uh, to protect your hands. And so some common things that I have seen and I put together here for you is burns, bruises, abrasions, cuts, punctures, fractures, amputations, and chemical exposures. So if we looked at a lot of the hand injuries from different organizations, from different companies, you would find that the majority of them will probably fit in one of these categories. There are many types of gloves. Now I want you to think of a glove like any other tool that you might use. Gloves must be appropriately selected in order to address the hazard uh, that exists for a particular job, job duty, or task. So I'm just going to go over a few of the different types of gloves here just so you can get an idea of the options that are out there. And believe me, we're only skimming the surface here. There are so many different types of gloves that we can choose from depending on what we need. So Norfoil laminate resists permeation and breakthrough by an array of toxic and hazardous chemicals as you can see in the upper right hand picture there. Butyl provides the highest permeation resistance to gas or water vapors and it's used for methyl ethyl ketone peroxides or methyl ethyl ketones, acetones, esters, uh, ethyl acetate, etc. So pretty interesting uh, product there used to make gloves. Uh, Viton is highly resistant to permeation by chlorinated and aromatic solvents. Nitrile uh, provides protection against a wide variety of solvents, harsh chemicals, fats, and petroleum products, and also provides excellent resistance to cuts, snags, and punctures, and abrasions. And we're not talking about the, the kind that you would see in a healthcare situation here, although doctors uh, and nurses sometimes do use nitrile gloves as an alternative to latex. Those gloves are much thinner, so what I just described wouldn't entail the thinner kind of gloves used in healthcare settings. Uh, there's Kevlar, which protects against cuts, slashes, and abrasions. We have stainless steel mesh gloves, which protect against cuts and lacerations. Metal fabricators, uh, people that work with sheet metal and butchers, all love the stainless steel mesh. Uh, kind of feels like uh, you're a knight or something like that uh, when you wear them. It's kind of neat. Let's go into body protection now and look at the different ways we can protect our body. So common body injuries or common causes of body injuries. Intense heat, splashes of hot metals and other liquids, impacts from tools, machinery, and materials, cuts, hazardous materials or hazmat, hazardous chemicals, contact with potentially infectious materials like blood, and finally, radiation. Body protection uh, is, is pretty much a very broad category. Now there are some in the health and safety field that think fall protection should fall under 
the body protection category, but uh, I'm of the opinion that fall protection is its own type of PPE. But any way you look at it, uh, we have other types of body protection that fit a little better with this category, such as cooling vests. Uh, what's interesting is NASCAR drivers, uh, NASCAR drivers will wear a cooling vest in order to uh, perform better in the in the hot summer months, uh, and so they don't get any uh, heat exhaustion that could lead to heat stroke. Uh, we have sleeves and aprons, as you can see here, uh, in dealing with certain kinds of hazardous uh, hazardous materials or chemicals. And you can see coveralls or full, or full body suits, and these are going to be geared towards more of the uh, hazardous waste operations or emergency response type activities where hazardous materials are involved frequently. So that is a good summary of the uh, personal protective equipment um, that we could possibly see in an industry and that's pretty common to pretty much every industry that there is you know eye, face, body protection as well as uh, gloves and the different types of gloves that we can possibly use. Now, although we skimmed the surface here, if you have more questions or need more information, I'd love to discuss it with you. But you have to call or email to get my attention, and we can discuss it from there. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you.